Next on Astronomy Toronto, share the most exciting stellar event of 1987, the discovery of a supernova with Canadian astronomer Ian Shelton. here this morning to talk about uh, an event of uh, the greatest importance to the university and to uh, the world of uh, astronomy at large and we're delighted that you could uh, join us to hear about it and I'd like to ask Professor uh, Garrison to introduce the subject to you. We brought Ian Shelton back, uh, that's the main uh, uh, subject uh, for today and we also have some absolutely gorgeous uh, an absolutely gorgeous photo that Ian Shelton brought back with him a color photo taken under absolutely idyllic conditions down there so uh, he's been remote on, uh, on a remote mountaintop uh, for uh, the seven weeks since it was discovered and he's uh, been essentially inaccessible to most of the press because the telephones don't work we have a radio link uh, telephone uh, and it just hasn't worked lately so very few people have gotten through to him this is your chance and nobody else is getting it and essentially uh, except here in Toronto that is uh, anybody who's here gets it. It certainly is a pleasure to uh, introduce Ian Shelton to you. Ian is 30 years old and married he hails from Winnipeg uh, he holds a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Manitoba in Physics and Astronomy. And he first joined our staff in 1981 as our resident astronomer in Chile. Most people who have held that position have only taken it on for a year, and the isolation and uh, lack of interaction on a mountaintop in a desert in South America have uh, usually led them to do something else after their year. But Ian, in fact, spent two years down there initially, he then left us in mid-1983 and uh, spent a couple of years uh, pursuing other interests, uh, among them uh, planetarium work, uh, things of that kind, and then rejoined us in the same capacity again in 1985 and has spent the last two years again uh, working as our resident astronomer there. His position there is uh, coming to an end in a few months and he will uh, again be pursuing other interests after that. His job there is primarily to maintain and look after the telescope and auxiliary instruments and feed our interest there generally. He shows uh, visiting astronomers who are coming for the first time how to use the instruments and their capabilities, etc. And he also does uh, routine observing for astronomers who are unable to be present in Chile themselves. I think that's probably as much introduction as you really need. You'll be anxious to ask Ian other questions yourself, so I'll turn you over to Ian. Uh, so I have to ask you, this is really the first time we're hearing from you, what do we basically know now that we didn't know before? What's changed? Uh, we know a lot of things now, but I think we've got a lot more questions. Uh, I guess there was one of the first things that made this such an interesting supernova was that supposedly we knew the precursor star, and that has changed. Um, the identity of the precursor, uh, the star that was uh, before the supernova, has changed backwards and forwards. It's very difficult. The supernova is so bright that you cannot see very close in around the star. So it's very difficult to, to know exactly what is left over in terms of if there was a star very close to it that you thought was the supernova. You can't tell that. You have to use lots and lots of different bits of information and slowly clue it together. So the, um, there was a, a star at the position, and initially that was thought to be what is now the supernova. Uh, then somebody said that that star was not there anymore. Uh, 
Um, now and then, for the third switch, they said that it was. So uh, the, I think the batting is now switched over again. So now they say that this star is gone, and that might be real. Um, the supernova. We've been observing it long enough that we have a good feel exactly where the supernova is and exactly where the other star was, and they seem to be the same star. But again, that can change again. How significant do you read this finding? Can you tell us what you said or felt when the light bulb went <laughs> Right. Uh, it certainly is significant. There's no doubt about it. It's our first crack um, to really look carefully at a supernova. We've been watching supernovas for a long time. Well, long time in astronomy is is 30 years. That's all of astrophysics is maybe only 50 years old, or I guess present day astrophysics. It goes maybe only 100 years back if, if you want to go further. Um, this particular event is, is very, very important. There's a big gap between what theoreticians at the cutting edge do and what observational astronomers at the cutting edge do. And that's simply because it's hard, you, you can't set up the experiment in, in astronomy. It's one of these very strange sciences where you don't have a, a laboratory where you can sort of arrange the, the events for the future, you know, for, for analysis down the road. Uh, you've got to simply be sitting and waiting or have a good guess where you should be looking because you can't look everywhere. There's a limitation on where you can look and what you can look with. Um, it means that when something like this happens and you can catch it so early and there's so much information coming from this one event, uh, I don't think there's anything that really can compare in recent history, in astronomy anyways, uh, in terms of what you'll get back from watching this. It was 4.30 in the morning when I finally looked at the, the finished result of, of the night's work and there was only about another hour's worth of nighttime. At, at that point, there was no, no doubt that there was something on the plate and that it was real. It wasn't an artifact or a plate flaw. Unfortunately, um, Time Magazine um, played up the idea that uh, a little joke, inside joke on the mountain about uh, plate flaws because these plates that I had been using were notorious for having very small little extra stars, but this certainly wasn't a small extra star. Um, Seeing the image on the plate, there was no doubt that there was an extra star, and it was very bright. This is the first thing is, I guess, disbelief. When, you, when I saw the image, it was clearly a good stellar image. It was, you know, there, there's no doubt that it was real on the plate. And I tend to believe the plate more than I would believe my own eyes. Uh, the first thing that ran through my head, though, was that this object was very bright. I could immediately estimate how bright it was from the other images on the plate. It would have had to have been visible. And so the second thing that hit me was why I hadn't seen it after guiding for three hours on this particular plate, looking sometimes in the general direction, it hadn't occurred to me that, you know, that there was anything unusual. Other people, of course, after the fact, do feel that they had seen something in the, on the night, but the plate was confirmation. There was no doubt about it. I had the plate from the night before, pull the two out, compare them side by side. You immediately know that there was something possibly there before, uh, but nothing, nothing as bright as what you saw on, this, on the plate of the supernova. And of course, confirmation comes by putting on your coat, walking outside, looking up, and it was there. There's no doubt about it. Your pulse total at, Well, at that point, it was <laughs> put on the coat, and I, I actually I didn't even stop. I just started walking up the road, looked up when I, when I cleared the, the horizon, saw the, the star, and I just kept walking. I walked to the, to the nearest, I guess, other place where there were people. I walked to the 40-inch telescope, another telescope on the mountain, uh, where I could talk to somebody else about this. Um, basically just walked into the control room and then solely sort of uh, asked them if they thought there was you know, anything unusual about a fifth magnitude star in the supernova, <laughs> in the LMC, I should say. Um, I think that was really quite good uh, because immediately the first thing is, I, I tend to downplay things just, I guess, for protection. Um, ANOVA was the first thing that came to mind, you know, something not particularly bright. Um, and ANOVA is, a, is, is a, a, a very miniature version of a supernova. It's an exploding star, but of much less force. But also a lot more common yeah. and, and not nearly as significant. <clears throat> um, you get several novas, not particularly bright ones, but several novas a year on, in a good year. So in this particular case, um, we sort of tried from the back end and, and slowly worked our way up. It took, I guess, about 30 seconds of working our way up to to finally get everybody to walk outside. Uh, the other confirmation came with uh, the night assistant at the 40-inch uh, had mentioned that he had seen something. And I think that was great because uh, the second two people, uh, well, I, I have the proof in the terms of the plate, but I know also had seen it. But he had also seen it earlier, at least thought he had had a, a reason to believe that there was something unusual in the LMC going on. So uh, with that, we all walked outside, looked up, and, there, and it, again, another 30 seconds before we all convinced ourselves that it was real. It, of course, in the telegram, it went out that it was a possible supernova in the LMC. At this point, you, you still want to be really, really careful. Uh, you, don't want, you want everybody to look at it, but you don't want everybody to get their hopes up just in case. What is 
I'm not quite sure at this point. Um, a lot more work. That's uh, the career as between now and, and August. Um, it's business as usual, except that I've added an extra two hours of observing every night. But after August, uh, I really don't know. At this point, I've I made a decision before the supernova that uh, I would be leaving the University of Toronto's Southern Observatory, simply because there are a lot of other things that I want to do. And you're tired of living on a mountain for four years. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is I, I don't know if I'm tired of living on the mountain, so it's better that I get off. <laughs> <laughs> no. I feel rather ridiculous then. I, I, I have to apologize. I'm really not used to this, and um, I don't think I'll ever get used to this. I thought after two months it would be all over with, and I feel a lot better that uh, we had sort of let everybody else know. I think this is the most important thing is that I want to share this with other people. Uh, it's a bit unfortunate because it's the southern hemisphere that's going to get the best view of it. I, you can't get it unless you're quite close to the equator or a lot further south. And in that respect, I'm trying very hard to bring back pictures, communicate the excitement. It's a beautiful thing to see, um, especially if you have a little bit of feeling for what it is that you're looking at. And that's why the scientific, little bit of scientific information that we have to throw out every now and then is simply because you need that to really understand the significance of the event. Because it could take you years before you finally realize how significant it really is. And I want everybody to have at least taken the time to look at it now, whether it's in photographs or media, while it's fresh, while there is the chance. Because you won't get another chance. That's the key. How you describe your life by mm. uh, It's no, it's it's a full life, but the, the snag full life, but it's much more restricted from what you people would be used to, I guess. Um, I tend to replace you know, I don't watch television, I don't listen to the radio anymore. Television is, is local. Um, the radio is a bit of a pain, it's short wave if anything, and I find that very you know, it, it's too much effort to try to get any information from the world. So in the end, it's basically music. We've got great music collection, everything from, I guess, Bach to, well, uh, we won't go into detail. It's, it's a good collection of music. Um, it's, it's evolving, put it this way. I've, I've changed my tastes a little bit. Uh, I guess some people don't appreciate my taste. Which tastes. direction? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Op opera's getting there, right? Oh, really? <laughs> Uh, it's rewriting a lot of the books. It, I don't know if you can say it's disproving because theoreticians have been very, very careful. There's always somebody who can, can show that he's got the counterpoint to what might be common belief. So uh, it's just a matter that we don't have a lot of observations. I mean, trying to, to, to qualify what goes on in the whole universe is, is a big task. And the little bits and pieces that we throw out as common knowledge, I think it's, it's fair play to say that, that it will be written every few years, simply because the, as we get more information, we do rewrite things. Is the supernova still brightening now? Uh, yeah, that's the fun part about this, is that um, it hasn't stopped getting brighter. Uh, it initially became very, very bright in one day, a very, very large jump, 1,000 to 10,000 times brighter. And at first people thought, because it showed a little trend of going over the top and coming down, over a period of one week, that it was on the way down. And then it sort of sat, <laughs> didn't go any further. So it stayed at roughly the same brightness for a long time. And now it's been creeping up very, until very slowly. The, and until the 12th of March. And since the 12th uh, of March, it's been going up about 2 or 3% a day. Still? Two, it still is, last, it hasn't as, as of two days ago. As of Sunday. Uh, yeah. It was cloudy last night. <laughs> so, yeah. If I remember correctly, <clears throat> the theory had been that it was going to peak and then go down a long time ago. There, there are a lot of theories. All supernovas to date go up and then come down. This one, we haven't observed it long enough to watch it coming down. The, uh, the problem is that uh, this it belongs to a type 2 supernova category. And it, by definition, uh, almost by definition, is a real zoo. There's, there, there's no nice, firm uh, theory or model that fits it. Type 1s, uh, there's another type of supernova which is brighter. Uh, you can see it at larger distances. It's usually b better understood in terms of, of its light curve. Unfortunately, it teaches a, a lot less about uh, things that go on in the world. This is really quite good. It doesn't fit good models right now, but that's just a failing of people to build good models. There are other things that have occurred in, in the recent past in astronomy where um, people felt that they needed a particular model, a very grandiose, very glorified model to explain a mechanism that seemed to be unexplainable by any other means. And in astronomy, you come to expect that. Uh, thermal nuclear power for the sun. I mean, it, it's something that you needed a long time before you knew the mechanism. 
you just by just by looking at what, what you saw in the data. And so that there's a possibility that we're seeing something unique, something very, very exciting, because it's the first time this type of event has ever been seen. But there's also a possibility that we're just looking at the data in a way that we still don't have enough pieces to clue it together and come back with a much, much more rational, much less grandiose mechanism. At, at this point? At this point in time. At this point, we don't have enough information. We really don't. Ian Shelton dies. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, at this point it's confusing. It was expected to go down, but it didn't. And it's still going up. That's it, this, this is the, the, the real gist of what I just said, is that it's going up. It's, it's not staying constant. It's not slowly going down. It's actually getting brighter. But there's the possibility that, for example, that the, the remnant, what is left over from the explosion, uh, what is left over of the star, uh, is very hot and is producing a tremendous amount of energy. But because the shell of what was around this core of the star is moving outwards. That's what we're seeing emitting a lot of the light initially. It moves out, it's very hot, very bright, and it's getting bigger, so it causes the star to look brighter. But there's only so much energy in that, and it cools off, and it, it dissipates. But if there's still a very, very bright object, extremely hot, extremely bright object in the center, it can still be radiating energy, giving energy to the inside of this moving out shell, and keeping the shell to look bright. And there's a possibility that that's what we're seeing. We're, we're seeing what is the pulsar or the neutron star on the inside making the whole supernova glow brighter by the day. You know, every day it gets brighter. That's exciting because that's the first time that we, the, the, the pulsar is, is, the, is the meat of what's going on right now. Computer simulations are wonderful things because you can tweak a few parameters and get a really bizarre results. If they're too unusual, then you, you just dismiss them. But in this particular case, it is an unusual event that maybe somebody has dismissed in the past and dusts off the, his papers and, or runs his program again and finds out that, yes, he can simulate this kind of event, but he just never thought it was real. So there's a chance that, that people are on top of this. I, we shouldn't say that the theoreticians are completely clueless. It's just that there are so many possibilities, there's so many parameters to deal with that it's not an easy thing to explain. It's not easy to model a supernova explosion. And so it'll be years, it, it always is years before people can, even common supernovas, ones that we see every year, uh, get pieced together. Well, if, you, if we think we know the distance to the LMC, which I think we do, um, and the, moving at the speed of light, the light is, is 150, 160,000 years old. So we're looking, at, in astronomy you have to learn very, very quickly that everything that you're looking at is already past news. It's happened a long time ago. The further you look away, the older it is that you're looking. Uh, so is this 2,000 years, a billion years old? This is 106, at least 150,000 years old. But I don't think that's, we're seeing it happening real time because we're, even though it's very old, the light that's coming, and the next day the light is 150,000 and one year old, or one day old, it's, it slowly progresses. So we're seeing it happening in real time for our interests. It is really happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, but we're not seeing a fossil. I mean, I think they have to be clear about that. We're, we're not see, seeing, seeing a fossil. We're seeing the event. It it's just took like, the light yeah. that long to get to yeah. us. It's like digging up a dinosaur that's 150,000 years old. <laughs> Somebody asked me that on my one day off in a bar in Serena. <laughs> and I got really upset. <laughs> I, this, this is two months later, and I won't get quite as upset. I seriously doubt that. I don't know any astronomer that gets, well, I don't know a lot of astronomers that get wealthy from discoveries in astronomy. Just t-shirts and pins is maybe the way to go, but it's not my style. <laughs> what does it cost to run the observatory? Uh, yeah, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, it, it, uh, we, we get um, some support from the NSERC, from the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, and from, uh, and from U of T sources, alumni and, uh, and other sources. Uh, the total cost uh, depends on whether you include travel, uh, because we have an endowment fund that uh, that uh, helps with student travel, so uh, just a few res uh, uh, reservations before I give you a figure, uh, we get 96,000 from NSERC, uh, and we probably spend a total of about 30 or 40,000 beyond that from U of T sources. So we're certainly hoping uh, that uh, we're, the way I express it is that we, we actually two years ago um, started on the 50th anniversary of the David Dunlap Observatory and we started a fundraising campaign 
for a new telescope in Chile in our, at, at the Southern Observatory, which has been so successful. Uh, I'm hoping that by the time the supernova gets too faint for our little 24-inch telescope, we'll have a two-meter telescope in place down there. So we are embarking on a fundraising campaign, and this will, cannot uh, uh, do anything but help. Without supernovae, there wouldn't be any heavy elements. Uh, uh, stars like the sun, common stars, uh, don't uh, have thermonuclear reactions going in the center of them, and, but they, they build up the periodic table of elements uh, only up to iron 56. And beyond that, uh, there's not enough uh, energetic neutrons around to build up the higher, uh, le heavier elements. So things like gold and silver, uh, you know, gold and your rings and so forth, all come from supernova. All the heavy elements, gold, silver, platinum, uranium, everything like that, comes from uh, supernova explosions that happened before the sun was formed. And the sun was then formed out of enriched material uh, from previous supernovae. Uh, so that's one of the main, uh, <laughs> supernovae are very important in the, pro in the whole life process uh, from that point of view. For me, it's, it's a very personal start. Um, it's so much, not so much because I was the first one to see it, but because it, it, it says so much. Um, it's, you know, it's a rare opportunity to see it. It's happening when I'm looking at it. Uh, the odds of, of me being at the right place at the right time and having it come off uh, in front of my camera or in, actually in front of my eyes indirectly, that's, that's a great feeling. It's, it's fantastic. But it's not so much just my star. I think now the next thing is, is to, to share it with as many people. Again, it's, I think this is for everybody to share. And for me, it's, it's certainly moving me in terms of it really is uh, giving me incentive to keep looking at it because um, I'm, I'm doing everything I can. It's not from a scientific, analytical point of view to stare at it. It's, it's not uh, a cold science. Astronomy and sciences in general aren't really that cold. It's, you're trying to learn a tremendous amount. The more you learn, the better a feel that you have for what go, is really going on, <clears throat> so that you can sort of add it to, to the whole scheme of things and to your whole everyday life. I mean, it, it's, it's just one small thing, but it's, it's, it's such an important small thing. It's a single star. It's a single point in time. But it certainly is relevant to me because it is such an important event. This is Rob Fisher for Astronomy Toronto with Ian Shelton, the discoverer of the recent supernova. And uh, Ian, uh, I'm as overwhelmed by this as you've been by the press today. You know, I'm not a normal reporter here, but uh, what was your first impression coming back to Toronto here? I knew what I was in for before I left Chile, so um, I said, what's going to happen is going to happen, so let's, let's do it. Um, it was great to be back, but you know, I'd rather be observing. Where does the supernova stand right now? This is a reiteration for some people, but let's first of all talk about the distance. Okay, it's approximate, well, depending on what distance scale you want to use, it's something, somewhere in the ballpark of about um, 160,000 light years away. And current brightness, because a lot of our people listening are astronomers, is? Okay, it's 3.2, roughly 3.2, 3.21 in the visual um, as of Sunday night and it's probably a, another 500 spiders. So it could be about 3.15 by now. And just for the layman, uh, how would that compare in brightness to, say, stars in the Big Dipper? People know those bright. Okay, it's comparable. Um, a little bit fainter, but not much. Um, the difference with this star is that, although it would be a little bit fainter than the stars in the Big Dipper, this star is extremely red. So if you think of stars like Betelgeuse and so right, on, right, yes. uh, that makes it a bit different. It's certainly not as bright as, as the, the red star in Orion, but it's, it's certainly, um, it could be. In the telescope, it looks the same. So. And uh, current size? Um, the dimensions of the shell moving out are well, many, many astronomical units, but still not, not as close as the distance from here to the nearest star. You have to remember that the, the constraints on the material moving out from the supernova is that it can only move at the very fastest, uh, at the speed of light. Right. And light doesn't travel very fast in, in astronomical terms. So if it's, say, two months old, 60 or 65 days, I can't even remember anymore. If it's, if it's say, 60 days old, then it's 60 light days is the distance. And it's, and it's the order of uh, several days distance from here to, to the edges of our solar system. So it's a, several times, it's maybe um, 
a thousand or ten thousand times the volume of all this, everything that's contained within our solar system. So it's, it's a very, very large shell. It's not as far as the nearest star, but it's getting there. Give it a, a, a few years and it'll, it'll get that far. If you don't have a sense of where you are and what you are, then, then for example, why, why bother with astronomy? What is the value for, for a layperson or for anybody in astronomy? And that's a really difficult question to ask, but then that's like, that's the, like the ballet or painting or arts. It's the same sort of argument. It's, it's for something that hopefully means that we're more than, than just uh, the numbers that, are, that we get. It's, it means that if we are actually trying to understand what we're seeing when we look at the world. That's, I think, um, the important thing is to, to understand that what we're trying to do when we do astronomy is to, to, is to get a better understanding of the world out there. For, for emo emotion is how we, we relate. Um, our senses is one thing. Um, in astronomy, you tend to always think in terms of, of what's in your head, in terms of, because you have to handle the numbers, you have to handle the things. But when you really get comfortable, that's the nicest thing about astronomy, because then immediately you don't have to think, oh, it's 150,000 light years. The scale just suddenly clicks. You understand how far something is. And, and that's the nicest thing in terms of the, when you really get a handle, you're really getting a real feeling for how big and how significant the world is, and maybe how insignificant we are. But then we're looking at it, so that can't, we can't be totally useless. I think the important thing is that the supernova is, is, is probably going to immensely improve uh, models on stars in general, simply because to get to this kind of behavior, to get a star to do what it's doing, it must be pretty strange. And well, you're certainly not strange, and uh, makes you proud to feel that you're a Canadian here with uh, <laughs> this outstanding Canadian astronomer. It's Ian Shelton, discoverer of the supernova. I'm Rob Fisher for Astronomy Toronto.